dear friends and uh, Africa interested lovers or skeptics, whatever. I'm happy to uh, greet you here on behalf of the Bruno Kreinsky Forum. Um, this is uh, the first um, in-person meeting that we have after about six months. The last one we had with Jan Pospisil on South Sudan. Um, and I'm very happy that for this occasion, and in fact it was his wish uh, that we have Roland Marshall here for the first time uh, in the Kreisky Forum. Uh, the option was to have an, a Zoom meeting earlier on, and he said he would uh, prefer a real meeting. Um, close to me is Marie Roger Villois. She is an old friend of the Kreisky Forum, has been here a number of times, and she is an old hand in Austria uh, as a disciple of the Diplomatic Academy. Uh, on the invitation, you have seen the name of Gerald Heinzel, and those who know him will see that this is not Gerald Heinzel, it's Günther Barnett. He's from the Ministry of Defense, uh, and he really was kind enough to come in at, at the very last moment. Gerald Heinzel had COVID, you know that, and in his case, he uh, is already negative, but he still is very sick. I, could, uh, I can vouch for this. The topic of today is the Horn of Africa. Um, in the invitation, we are saying that this is one of the neuralgic points, not only of Africa, but probably of the world. Um, the Horn of Africa uh, is the smaller part here on the map. Uh, in fact, Somalia, uh, Ethiopia, Djibouti, and Eritrea. This is the Horn of Africa. What you also see here are the members of uh, IGAD, the in Intergovernmental Authority uh, on Development. Um, IGAD is the regional organization. You have an even larger geographically entity that is East Africa, that would then uh, go down to Tanzania and uh, the uh, Burundi, uh, Rwanda. Um, the Horn of Africa and IGAD, we, we will talk, uh, or Roland will talk of, of them uh, together because they are, uh, they have to be treated together. Uh, these are at the moment countries, a number of countries in crisis. I don't think one could say of anyone that it isn't in a kind of crisis. Um, but there's also another point that uh, could be touched and should be touched, that the situation today, the Ukraine uh, uh, situation, the aggression of Russia in the uh, Ukraine, is changing also our view of Africa and our relations with Africa. And in a way, we are going to touch on this uh, at least a little bit. Uh, what are the consequences for European-African relations uh, in that? And the Horn of Africa stands uh, really as a, one example. What we should also, what we will also talk about is the Horn of Africa not only as one geographic entity, but rather as this neuralgic point where there are a number of new actors that haven't been there 20 years ago. Uh, this is not only China. China is almost an old hand in Africa now, but it is the whole, the, uh, all the Gulf states, it's Turkey, and it is also Russia. One could say Russia again, or uh, that was that what remained of the Soviet Union. So uh, this is a whole bundle of questions. It will be difficult uh, to cover this in the short time of one evening. Uh, 
Roland Marchal is a master uh, of this region. He has spent a lot of time and uh, he will try uh, to, to do this and then we will uh, have a discussion here on the podium and then with you. Roland, uh, yes. please. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for this invitation. And thank you as well so much for allowing me to express uh, my views on the region I have been working mostly all my professional life on. Uh, thank you to Gerhard. Uh, and I would say as well, thank you to Vienna to host uh, the, uh, the conference on the uh, nuclear agreement for Iran because myself personally, as I guess many, uh, I hope that um, maybe very naively that uh, re reinforcing this agreement may allow some people to get released from jail and as well the Iranian population to not suffer as it's suffering today from international sanctions. There are, <clears throat> of course, very different ways to consider the Horn of Africa and actually there are very different definitions. Uh, Georg quoted uh, three countries Myself, I would die, but I think without Sudan, there is no horn. And I'm sure that uh, many other people will claim that, uh, how could you do without Kenya? And, uh, and then anyway, Djibouti is a village. So we could, we could agree to disagree on the definition. And, and this is uh, certainly uh, something that could um, be um, funny, maybe not useful. Uh, but, but one point that I want to stress from the beginning, and maybe we would, we would come back on the q and is, is despite very strong national identities in this region, we have communalities and cultural communalities that are very strong. I was talking uh, just before this uh, uh, meeting about the music. Uh, you know, it's very common, uh, contrary to whatever uh, we think about politics in the region to have uh, Ethiopian music uh, heard by Somalis who uh, will certainly hate Abasha, the Ethiopians. You will have South Sudanese music uh, heard on the market in Khartoum and so on and so forth. So there are so many aspects that uh, you know, go much beyond uh, the uh, traditional opposition we are discussing. Another aspect that uh, makes this region very singular, very exceptional, is, is the only region in Africa where we could witness the, the birth of new states. Already two. Some people uh, maybe in the room are waiting for the third one because they like big families. Uh, so South Sudan, Eritrea first in 1993, South Sudan in 2011, and some dreams maybe Somaliland uh, sooner than later. So this is absolutely exceptional and, uh, and this could be discussed in the, the sense that what does it mean uh, to the history of state building of all those states in the region, uh, knowing that state building is not only a national uh, process, it is very much a regional one. A third aspect is, uh, as uh, Georg as well alluded to, is to see, well, the Horn of Africa is, is, you mean the Red Sea, you mean Babel Mandeb, you mean uh, actually the Suez Canal, which is uh, farther north, but certainly a strategic road for um, uh, international trade today. And, uh, and of course, uh, a strategic trade uh, road uh, for international trade, but as well, very turbulent riverine countries. Other We'll actually discuss more the connections between the Gulf states, especially uh, the Arabian Peninsula and the Horn of Africa. And maybe stress because, uh, you know, Afghanistan is not the end of the history, uh, that uh, still you have uh, jihadi groups operating quite successfully in uh, Yemen as well as in Somalia. And, and may uh, eventually uh, have uh, even uh, influence in, in what I would call the greater horn to include uh, Kenya uh, and maybe Tanzania later on. Uh, uh, so we could, we could say that. We could as well, 
and that's only and that's not the end of the definition uh, just uh, say well the one of africa today is an area in africa that is facing one of the most harmful droughts uh, with millions of people millions of life at risk and as well for this there is, a, there is the communality in the in the precarity in the fragility of livelihood in that region now what i would like to do uh, is maybe to reflect on changes that happen over the last 30 years because to to a large extent uh, in the late 1980s the horn of africa was reconfigured by the end of the cold war it wasn't always the end of the cold war as itself but certainly this moment was crucial for most countries and today what we see is whatever mistakes achievements uh, at these changes uh, over the last 30 years are put into question by um, uh, uh, political processes uh, on, on wars, on, on conflict in, in that region. And so it's maybe interesting to reflect, especially at the time uh, most people have in mind the war in Ukraine on what may uh, come uh, if uh, the confrontation goes on with China as a, a new sort of a Cold War uh, that will be uh, first uh, developed or unfurled at the expenses of third world countries, and especially African countries. Now, let us take Sudan. Sudan, June 1989, a coup happened led by a gen uh, not a general uh, at that time uh, a single colonel full colonel called omar bashir and and then developed into an islamist regime that lasted for nearly 30 years 31 years and was basically uh, disbanded in 2011 uh, 2019 when demonstration forced the army to uh, actually overthrow, arrest Omar el Bashir, and after months of demonstration, accept uh, a transition, a quite chaotic transition, uh, with the civil with the civilian uh, wing, led by um, uh, Professor Am Amduk, and uh, up to a coup that that happened in October last year. As I said, I want to start with Sudan because few people pay attention to uh, the magnitude uh, or the, the meaning of that uh, revolt. It was uh, the, the same way Sudan was uh, uh, an Islamist regime that claimed and that is Islamism and tried to build uh, international alliances of uh, radicals. The, the same way this, uh, this protest was in, in some way extremely secular, was trying to reverse not only a dictatorship, but uh, try to find a new sense of nationhood. We, we could say today that uh, they failed. It's maybe early to say that. But what we see is the situation in Sudan is very uncertain. Uncertain as it used to be, late 1988, when the country was economically collapsing and people didn't know whether the old political parties would be able just to, to tackle the problems, make drastic decisions and help the country to move on. What we see today is problems that are very relevant for other parts of the continent. First, the corporization of the army. Throughout the 30 years, the Sudanese army did not do much war. Actually, he used artillery, like others in Eastern Europe, and built militias to fight the war the army didn't want to fight. And this was paid by a, a, a greed, a, the control of uh, many positions in the economic realm. Some in the, in the oil market, in the mining, in gold 
mining, in the uh, new technolo information technology. And of course, the transition, the end of Bashir, raised the question of the future of the army on the way and, and, and tried to propose a way, maybe not the right one for what happened later on, uh, for the army to go back to barracks and maybe to lose this preeminence on the economic realm. A second aspect that is crucial is uh, the militianization. The militianization of the army and the militianization of the population. It is something that I, I raise as very significant because I believe this is happening in Ethiopia as well as Somalia, but as well as many other parts of the continent. I could talk about Central African Republic, a country I'm studying as well, but I could mention Mali, and certainly what we see in Niger and in other places could raise, in Nigeria could raise as well questions, not to mention maybe others that you know too well. So the question is, uh, you know, what's going to happen with those militia? What is the impact of those militias in uh, controlling violence or dis dispersing violence among the social setting and as well about uh, the way you could think again about uh, collective identities. You know, one of my close friends from the early times uh, said after the coup, some, some weeks, so two months after the coup, that she was wondering whether Sudan still existed because Darfur groups were playing with um, militias in, in uh, Khartoum. Uh, they were fighting as well in, in South Côte d'Afan, in, in Blue Nine, and so on. And so the question was, what, what, what Sudan would mean at the end of the day, having, quote unquote, already lost South Sudan? This is certainly a sense that uh, should be questioned. The third is the economic predicament. It's, it's something very, uh, that we should reflect, not only because of COVID consequences, the, the fact that, uh, you know, to a large extent, what has been happening on the continent up to now has been very much driven by resources, raw materials, taken away by uh, global powers. Yesterday, Western countries, then China, then emerging countries like Turkey and others, now today, Russia. But the... Uh, let us say the model, the framework for developing uh, Sudan, it could be so many could, other things could be said about Ethiopia, is still uh, very problematic and, 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 and should raise uh, specific uh, questions beyond the question of the oil revenues or beyond the question of uh, the Ukraine war and its, and its consequence on, uh, and, uh, on food and energy prices. The third aspect I want to touch here is uh, this uh, discrepancy between rapid political changes and the inability to uh, structure a new political arena. It is maybe, uh, maybe in a few decades, we will look back at uh, this period saying that was normal, that was the time needed to do, uh, to have new political forces emerging from uh, social protest, political confrontation or conflicts. But, but for the time being, I must confess, for an analyst like me, is more chaos than anything else. Ethiopia, as well, is not providing us with, uh, you know, a very optimistic picture. Let us remember late May 1991, when Eritrea was already controlled by uh, EPLF and Isaiah Safiwoki. Late May, the EPLF took control of what was left from the Mengistu regime in Addis Ababa. Contrary to uh, expectations, uh, actually peace prevailed mostly. There were some incidents, but not that brutal. And a new constitution was passed in 1994. Then things start going the wrong way. But, but certainly for most observers, 
Ethiopia was the, the regional power, the, the pivot state, and, and therefore, uh, on his ethnic federalism was basically answering a question that has been uh, framing all political discussions on all confrontations in the Ethiopian political arena from the early 1960s. Yet, we had the international community and the West had a huge expectation on Mele Zenawu, the leader of, of this country for, for so many years, who passed away in 1990, uh, 2012. Uh, but Mele Zenawi was certainly very smart. He was as well a modernizer to a large way. He was, but he was certainly not a Democrat. And he was some, someone who advocated uh, an adjudamento of ideology, but kept uh, the worst part of Marxist-Leninism to get rid of his opponents inside and outside his political party. Now, 2018, a new prime minister took over. And we had, uh, at, at one point, uh, the feeling that uh, things were changing for the best or for the better. Well, we happen to be wrong once more. Uh, but certainly, uh, things have changed. Uh, there are, again, a few uh, considerations. I would make uh, a couple that echo what I said about Sudan. The first one is the dramatic or the, the strategic role played by the security apparatus. To a certain extent, the, the crisis and the war in Tigray is only the illustration of the, uh, of the competitions within the security apparatus. The fact that uh, suddenly uh, those um, leading uh, uh, Tigray would not be sure anymore to come back to Addis Abeba, and the way those in Addis Abeba saw that they could get rid of any opposition. This means as well that since the army was the site of uh, purges, reshuffle, and so on, when incidents started and when the war started, the key elements in the fighting were not the army, was the militias, what they called the Liu police, the special police forces, which happened to be militias set up by federal state who play a dramatic role in the violence and the rapes and the killings that occurred from uh, November 2020. This ethnic federalism was certainly a, a framework or an attempt to solve a, a, a very genuine problem that wa was creeping for decades, if not from the beginning of the, uh, from the modern Ethiopia, he had to be addressed, he had to be studied, he had to be renegotiated. The question was whether radical reforms or fine tuning was necessary, and it was up to the Ethiopian population to decide. The fact is that uh, taking into account the political culture developed after 1991, there is no Ethiopian population. The will of the population is expressed by the leadership of the, of the ruling political party, and that's all. So basically, war is on the agenda. The economy that, was, uh, that appeared at first as the, one of the greatest success in Africa, Ethiopia in the 2000s had a growth rate uh, that was often superior to 10%. So it was something, a uh, tremendous achievement that is witnessed by the urban development of Addis Abeba. Yet today, we have a much sober understanding of what happened. We see uh, the condition under which uh, Ethiopia is negotiating its debt with China. We see how a number of uh, companies, including Turkish companies, are closing doors because um, actually, the, the facilities are not what they are 
uh, doing. We see uh, the huge question marks on the uh, building, on, on, on possible working of the, of the GERD, this um, uh, dam, that would be able to generate electricity to supply much beyond Ethiopia, uh, Kenya, and uh, Somalia, uh, and certainly Sudan. So we could, we could talk again, I, I could talk again about uh, Somalia. 19, 1988 was, uh, you know, uh, the bombing of the two major cities in Somaliland. Uh, 1990, December 1990 was the time the capital city uh, actually uh, revolted against uh, Mohamed Siad Bari. And, and today, we see uh, uh, there, were, there was first an attempt to uh, solve the problem through clan factions. It failed, and in the 2000, Ethiopia, with other IGAD members, such as Kenya, tried to develop uh, their own model of solution, which was a kind of federalism based on clan. We could say that, not exactly, not typically what was uh, made in Ethiopia, but certainly very close. Today we see the failure of that. We see the failure, and, and we see this failure for, for two main reasons. One is when you build federalism, you need institutions and you need elites that have a sense of compromising. This has been missing in Somaliland, in Somalia. And then we see another aspect is this model, whatever name we put on it, has been basically the reinstallation of the old political system that developed, unfolded in, under the Italian trusteeship in the 1950s, basic, by which basically big clan families ruled the country. Okay, they, they compete among themselves, they compete one against the other, but, but basically, at the end of the day, you get a parliament and you get political elites that belong to those groups and that manage the country according to the wishes of those groups. Which means that all groups, marginalized groups, small clans among those clan families, suddenly add some interest to see Shabab, a jihadi organization, to develop to contest this old system. Not because they are especially jihadi or takfiri or, or uh, you know, adept of Al-Qaeda or even some Islamic states, just because this system is just the reproduction of what we fought against and what, and what we lost. So therefore, it shouldn't exist. Now, we could say uh, clearly, uh, uh, we could say Shabab is not a solution, uh, Shabab is this, Shabab is that, Shabab is a terrorist organization that pay little attention to human life, it's not untrue. But the truth is today Shabab is ruling more population than the Somali federal government, entertained by foreign money. Shabab has more legitimacy that many uh, local uh, administ federal administration set up thanks to Ethiopia, Kenya, or the European Union. That should be seen as a problem. Today, if I have a case against Georg, I would prefer to go to Shabab court because the judge is not corrupt and Shabab will make sure that the sentence, maybe against me, maybe against him, is enforced. I won't get that if I go to any government places. I will have to pay everyone the judge, the jury, and then the police, and then keep paying the police just so that the sentence is respected. So all those questions are in front of us. We don't want to see them because it's so easy to say that an organization is terrorist. And indeed, Shabab is terrorist. So we could say, okay, why those people are so unable to find their own solutions? Well, actually, they are not so unable. I think we are bringing our own problems to them. And, and what we have been witnessing over the last 
decades to be kind for, uh, to us is actually a growing involvement of uh, other countries. China, uh, that uh, certainly has a specific behavior I could answer in, uh, in uh, Q&A, but, but as well the competition between USA and China that uh, basically today stress artificially uh, the importance of a country like Djibouti, uh, try to, uh, you know, uh, certainly uh, promote Somaliland, I would say, without any conditionalities on, on the kind of political regime that's, that exists in Somaliland, which doesn't respect much its own minorities, and as well, still seeing in terms of uh, military bases in the region. We could talk about Russia, Russia has kept, Russia was, for, or the Soviet Union was extremely present in the Horn of Africa. Horn of Africa and Southern Africa were the two areas that were the most polarized uh, throughout the, uh, the Cold War. And, and Russia, after 1991, tried to keep some presence and some interest. It was unsuccessful, mostly because of his own internal pro problems, but in the 2000, and especially after 2015, they start again cultivating their relation with old um, uh, African elites uh, trained in, 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 in Moscow or other places. And to a certain extent, they rebuild co uh, links with uh, Sudan through different ways, sometimes through Egypt, sometimes through Iraq, sometimes as well through um, uh, Sudan uh, military. So today we are discussing the probability, the likelihood of a, a military base in post Sudan, uh, the expertise the, of uh, Russia in intelligence and uh, coercing people uh, and helping uh, militias had by the second, uh, the number two of the Genta. And, but we are, we are discussing other issues as well. We, are, we go regional. We are discussing uh, the vote of Eritrea at the UN General Assembly, uh, a, a statement that Eritrea in all political logic should have supported because that's the history of his struggle for independence, is just get out of my country. No, Eritrea voted, casted its vote in favor of Russia. We could as well question uh, the, the, the will of the Somali president in Mogadishu to visit Russia at the time he feels the Americans are increasingly cautious about his reading of the constitution, his ability to um, manipulate the, the, secret, the security services and his as well ability to split the national army that is already so weak and so necessary to safeguard the population. But Russia is not alone. Troublemakers are many in the area. And let me uh, end up quoting the Gulf states. I don't have any sympathy for any of them. What I have seen is how the divisions basically spread new conflicts in the Horn of Africa. Qatar, UAE, Riyadh, they are not the same regimes, they have not the same policies, they have not the same past in, in the Horn of Africa. But after June 2017, all of them worked for their own interest, whatever cost it means for local populations. So I could go into details in the, um, in the Q&A sections, but, but certainly, what I would like to stress is this, this policy is both, you know, when you look at it um, from a strategic perspective, it, it could have extremely positive aspects for the region because UAE uh, is rich, like Qatar. UAE is developing Berbera port in Somaliland, which is certainly uh, having a second port uh, besides uh, Djibouti is certainly a way to secure 
uh, the, the supplies for the Ethiopian population. So we could say to a certain extent, they could stabilize situation. To another extent, what we have witnessed is supporting uh, Isaias, Afewoki, or sometimes um, other federal states in Somalia or Kenya against Somalia in certain uh, border dispute is not actually cooling down situation, is, is making those situations untractable mm -hmm. and, and raising the cost of Qatar uh, or the allegiance to Qatar by Mogadishu government. So these are extremely disturbing trends and despite allegedly the reconciliation in the Gulf because they are supposed allegedly reconciled over the last year or so. Uh, what we see is those competitions, they keep going in the horn and not for the best of the horn at this very time. Mm -hmm. So let me conclude in a few words. One is we, the horn is not in a good moment. And it's important when you look at this situation to know that the horn has his, the, his, his proper resources to address this predicament. What he needs is benevolent international states, more than interventionist one. This is missing today. The second thing is we, after, it's very strange, after the how could I say, the Deirut, uh, the, the collapse of everything in Afghanistan. There was a feeling among Western states that actually we should move on, that, uh, and maybe the, act the, the news uh, give them some reason for that, that uh, we should move on, that uh, those jihadi conflicts are endless conflicts, that they don't mean anything, uh, that actually we are not um, the targets, which is true. Uh, both in Sahel and uh, in, uh, in the Horn. So therefore, it's up to African countries to, to make their own decisions. I would say, you know, the, um, the amount of hatred, the amount of coercion, the amount of the lack of expectations make a lot of people in the Horn of Africa prone to use violence to solve problems that should be solved by political dialogue. And therefore, I see uh, jihadi organization, whatever social reality it means, and it's important to differentiate the discourse, the doctrines on what actually is going on on the ground. I see these still uh, with a great uh, future in that region. I see that in Somalia, but I see it in parts of Ethiopia as well as in some areas in Kenya, without talking again about what's happening in, uh, in other parts of the continent because there are connections. It's not a big plan, but, but there are connections. So the, the, the question is uh, today whether um, the international community and the West will accept to look those countries for what they are, those problems for what they are, and, and decide whether they uh, do, uh, they carry, uh, they move on with the same proxy wars uh, against China, Russia, and others, or whether they accept that the Horn shouldn't be uh, the playing field of those countries and, and some restraint should be shown so that there is a rule of the game and there is space for the population and maybe for some kind of democracy. Thank you. Thank you, Roland, and uh, thank you also for the punct punctuality. <laughs> um, that was uh, really a magistral presentation of the home, and uh, there's lots on the plate for what we have to do. Marie Roger. Uh. No question? Just uh, oh, okay. The question will come after us. Okay. <laughs> okay, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, 
I'm uh, delighted to be here, although I am uh, very much concerned by uh, what is happening in France where I live. And uh, at some point tonight, maybe if you are not true, I will have to go and, and watch the debate everybody is waiting for between uh, Marine Le Pen and Emmanuel Macron. So um, this is a very big moment of tension in France because uh, whatever you read, people seem to find it li likely that Marine Le Pen can come to power in France, you know? And uh, I'm personally, I, I never believed it, but this time around, I'm, I'm a little bit concerned, I must say. Uh, so, um, and this is a very special moment. Uh, Mr. Marshall was speaking about uh, the Horn of Africa, and, um, and uh, we have right now, as you know, in the middle, in the heart of Europe, waging a terrible war on the European soil. And uh, that war will change, change, change many things. And also for Africa, and I think I will touch on it. So uh, just to say a word about the, the Horn of Africa. Um, I would say I've been dealing on a daily basis with Africa, but I would say with a focus on West Central Africa, maybe. And, um, but we have always considered the Horn of Africa as a very strategic part of the continent, a very strategic part of the continent, maybe even more so than West Africa with, I don't know what, Nigeria, maybe they have oil. Or, because on a, geopolitical standpoint. It's good to remind just a couple of points, like the Suez Canal, the Red Sea, all the routes, and we saw a couple of months ago um, just a, a tanker, I think it was a tanker or con container, mm -hmm. I don't know, yes, who, who was kept there. And uh, you saw, you, you just had a hint of what could happen if, when this route is, is blocked. That's just for international trade. And then we touch on, um, on, I would say, security issues. A little place like Djibouti has now, as we know, has French troops, a French base is there. Now the Chinese house, a, a very big one, maybe it's even bigger, larger. I don't have the, the numbers in, on top of, off the top of my head. Uh, a huge base and uh, my point is, I don't see, you don't feel that Europe is aware of what is happening in Africa as a whole and in the Horn of Africa in particular. So you have all new powers. Mr. Marshall mentioned that. There are many things happening now. They have been happening before, but they in intensifying on, on this uh, East Coast. And um, I could give many examples, but I just wanted to go uh, to uh, Russia today and just mention thing, a country like Kenya, which is also part of Horn of Africa, some, some, some people argue is the second row. But if you consider it's part of Africa, of, uh, of the Horn. You know, Kenya was one of the countries uh, which voted outright to condemn the uh, Russian uh, aggression, invasion of Ukraine. And uh, the ambassador to the UN was very vocal and giving absolutely outstanding example, saying you cannot claim a part of land because of history. If you do that, what would the Africans say? Because uh, uh, all the boundaries, most of the boundaries, as we know, 
as a result of uh, a colonial history of arbitrary, arbitrary um, uh, cuttings. And uh, so we cannot do that. And uh, as a matter of fact, the African Union has ruled that uh, we will maintain, all the countries maintain the colonial borders. We don't touch on that. Otherwise, it would be a, a huge mess, an endless mess. So a country like Kenya, uh, I would say, did the right thing. When you know that 35 countries in Africa did not vote to condemn uh, Russia. This is something special. Even countries like Senegal, you know, my own country, Cameroon, they didn't even attend the vote. They didn't want to be there, <laughs> you know. And Kenya voted against. But now, what happens? Um, they are turning, doing a turnaround. The ambassador of, Kenya, of uh, Ukraine wanted to be uh, received by, uh, at, uh, uh, by official there. They said yes, but then no. But uh, a couple of days later, they had a big meeting with the Russian ambassador, you know, just to, to show we are not with Ukraine anymore too much. We are not on this stand anymore so much. So you see something is shifting. It's not going this way, but that way. It's shifting, and I take the example of Kenya and Horn of Africa. Um, and if, if I may, uh, let me just say that what we see in Africa on that issue, because that's the current, um, that's what is happening right now, Ukraine and we are all concerned. But what you see in Africa right now is that many countries did not want to get involved, either on one side or to back Europe, actually, to, to back the Western world, because that's what it is, or, or even to back Russia. They didn't want that, some of them. They, there's something which is being revived. Um, Mr. Marshall mentioned sort of something like a new soft Cold War. Um, they are denying that. They don't get, they want, don't want to get involved in the Cold War again anymore, no. They want, if they want to revive something, that would be that non-aligned movement. They want to be non-aligned. Um, and there is a long story, there are many reasons of that. I don't say I agree or not, but there are reasons. Whenever you speak with people, uh, I mean, I was uh, in, in, in Cote d'Ivoire, two weeks ago in Cameroon, 10 days ago, and uh, everywhere, I mean, every people I could talk, talk to were supporting Russia. I mean, and the reason they give have nothing to do with what is happening, which is a blatant invasion of a Pacific, uh, a peaceful country. They think of the past, they think of uh, the, the double standard with Libya, they think of with Iraq, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, they, there's a long history. And myself, I realize how deep rooted this has been. Of course, we have been always uh, discussing history and uh, you know what they call the France Afrique or, or whatever you, the, all this colonial past which is still lingering on and, and uh, well, it's a common, obviously a common topic, but for the people, it's really changing the way they perceive their relationship to the Western world. This is something which is happening now and you have to pay attention on it. And um, a second point about Horn of Africa and Ethiopia. Our perception of that country, Ethiopia, as I've been mentioned, is the second or second or largest, second or third largest uh, country with 80 or 90 million uh, people, inhabitants, is um, a lot of potential. And for us, let's say Africans watching Africa, um, it has been sort of a model, not only 
because of its sort of uh, economic development, but because of the way they were dealing with ethnic groups and tribes. That the, per the perception we had as a federal republic uh, and uh, where in the, the constitution all the groups are, uh, uh, have a place and uh, we, you have to, to uh, elaborate a policy based on the ethnic groups. Because as you know, that's one of the topic in Africa, ethnic groups tribalism, whatever, you can call it the way you want. I did a special uh, program on that, um, on my channel, Africa International. And uh, we were like, ah, we could use, we could uh, base our reflection not on, um, on the basis of, uh, I would say, uh, European citizenship, that everybody is the same, and uh, just the law, and then you have citizens. It doesn't work. We see that it doesn't work. And what people refer themselves to is the tribe, the ethnic group, and that is powerful, really powerful. And uh, you see that, and it even more so, is not weakening that, that uh, sense of belonging. is not uh, smaller. It's even stronger every day. So we, if we were looking at Ethiopia, it was like, mm, maybe let's see how it works. So when all that sort of collapsed, the way we see, and it, 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 it leading to bloodshed and, and uh, huge destabilization of, of, the, of the state and the situation we have today, that's a huge, we are really, really disappointed. So we, we had also a, uh, a discussion on why it happens like that. And that. So I just wanted to point out that uh, there was something creative for us in the way they were conceiving their state, you know, based on their culture, based on their society. And uh, it seems not to work. So it's something we have to deal with too. Just one point, because there are so many things to say about Ethiopia like that. I think um, the people don't mention that uh, uh, often enough. The third thing I want to say about the Horn of Africa. Uh, so we, we have determined which countries are concerned, but let's say if we look at East Africa, so we have countries like uh, Ethiopia, Kenya, of course, Uganda, and um, they have an organization. We are very much for African integ integration, of course. Uh, we believe uh, one of the best way for Africa to move forward is to to build regional, mm. to make regional groupings and okay. And um, one of the largest is the ECOWAS in West Africa, who is doing, in my eyes, not so bad, really. Um, it's difficult. It's a long way to go, but it's uh, it's moving forwards. Um, in my in my home my, my home country is linked to uh, EEC, which is a Communauté d'Afrique Centrale. Well, uh, CEMAC, CEMAC is called CEMAC, which is brain dead. Nothing happens, <laughs> as you know. So, um, and then we look up to the EEC, which is East African Community. Now that is East Africa. And it's a very dynamic. They had a new member, uh, I think last week or 10 days ago, which, with uh, DRC, Congo. Uh, I don't say, I don't know if it was a good deal for them, but well, they are moving fast. And um, also on one of my program, we were showing how uh, swift and speedy they are, they are dealing with um, everything which comes from, from both importations you know, we have just one point and uh, the, 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 the goods can move over without any, uh, without too much bureaucracy and things like that. So this is that place which is uh, absolutely critical and uh, which is now in a turmoil. Mr. Marshall mentioned Somalia, mentioned all the countries. He made, he made global picture of the area. So you see Somalia. Somalia used to be stable, but dictatorship, 
and then since uh, Siad Barre left, he has uh, never recovered peace again, never again. I mean, how many years, 30, 40 years? So, and uh, you see all those countries, Sudan, South Sudan, uh, even Kenya has uh, terrorist attacks very regularly. Um, Uganda is uh, a country very much involved in destabilizing DRC Congo. Uh, so it's not an area where you have, it's not a very uh, stable and peaceful area. I would say, you would tell me, well, <laughs> there are many other parts in Africa which are not, which is true, uh, especially Sahel. But still, that one is, um, uh, arguably very violent and, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, you know, very concerning. There's one thing also which is, um, which is I want to, to, to pick up is the militias. You know, from time to time we look at the map of Africa and we say, oh, we know how many people, how many countries are at peace now? Oh, wow. There are 45 out of 55 or 54. Oh, now there are 40, 40. So we start the year, whenever you do a review of the year, you say there are more countries at peace, there are more democracies now where you have elections, you know, all kind of criteria. But the, we have always have a question about those militias. Where you, you just see a country like, um, Maybe I was thinking of uh, Central African Republic, but you can take all those. You can take um, to remain in the horn, like Somalia. Like Somalia, how come you cannot stabilize a country like Somalia because there are all those Shebab groups, uh, you know, when you look at them, they, they don't seem, seem so outstanding. How can a, a, a country with alliances, with international cooperation, with uh, whatever you want. How is it possible that a country can stay shaky and, and unable to, to, to move on uh, for decades because of militia groups? And you have them all over. You have them in DRC, you have them in Central African Republic. And uh, I, I mean, just look at the people. Sometimes they don't have shoes, they have nothing to eat, they are not. Uh, the weapons are very summary. So how is it possible that you cannot stop that? And this is a real problem in Africa, and I think um, we should continue on thinking about the militias and how to get away with militias because they are stopping the evolution of a whole, a whole continent. And the last thing I would touch on is, is about the uh, EU, African Union Summit as well. Um, there's so much to say. Maybe I will say more if you ask me questions. Uh, but uh, what happened in February was, um, uh, let's say, more of the same, more of what we have always seen that, um, and I've been following I would say the preps, the preps meeting in, in, in Lome and, yeah, and that they, uh, uh, the countries have been working on a common, a common program for, for years. And uh, you just see it, the European, first of all, always have an institutional approach of everything. Maybe it's in their DNA, but at some point we, we saw that there are a lot of limits and boundaries to it. Um, on the other hand, somebody like President Macron uh, has made the same statement and he, he came to the same conclusion that, uh, well, we've been working very much with, with uh, state institutions and that, and uh, that didn't work so well and there were a lot of resentment. So what we want to do now, we, we do another kind of summit, the African, France-African summit. We do it very differently without, with no head of states, but only with civil society. Oh, of course, that's what he did last year in, in Montpellier. 
Uh, now, it's like six years into it, or six months or eight months into it, you don't see, really see how uh, civil society can enforce decisions for a country, for instance. And now, he will get back, if he's elected, back to the, 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 the former formats. So what I want to say that it, there is something to think about. Uh, so how do we do, how, be, how can we be more efficient in working with Africa and showing that we know that our futures are bound together. I mean, Europe and Africa and neighbors, they are um, historic partners, there are so many things we know. And uh, there's a time now where, um, and just so to, to, to give a, another example of uh, uh, we, we, what a, a think tank, just stop me if it's too much, a, a think tank of African think tank uh, uh, in, in where I was, I was uh, working with them too. And one of the things, one of the ideas which came out uh, was that Europe has some topics, you know, security, development, governance, whatever, you know, we know them, and climate change. And, and that is, it's, and uh, one of my, my, my colleague added, we should ask one more, is communication. It's just to let Africa know that everything Europe is want to do is a win-win commitment, that good for Africa, it's good for Africans, good for Europeans. And uh, that came into, uh, we, we, we spoke about it, especially uh, when it came to um, map out these uh, military interventions uh, not, uh, ex uh, in, in Mali for Sahel to stop terrorism and whatever. So, um, I've been following that very, very closely, and we'll speak about it tomorrow with uh, at VIDC. Um, to make it short, I think at some point, if you just believe what I do is wrong and I, uh, is right, so I just do what I have to do, and that people are not convinced, they don't understand what you do, why you are doing it, and where their in interest, you will fail, and that's what happens. So there's a the, the need for that to communicate more and uh, to exchange more to the larger public about the goals of that cooperation, uh, the, the, the outcomes, the expected outcomes, the real outcomes, and, and, and just make it one of the sections which is to build in. So I will st stop here because uh, you said I had 10 minutes. I'm sure I, I was not so Thank positive. you. Um, it wasn't much more positive than Roger, uh, than uh, Roland, excuse me, Marie Roger. Um, <clears throat> there be many things to say about this. I will come back to this. But first, uh, I'll turn to Günther mm -hmm. and let us have your reactions or okay. reflections. Yes, uh, George, thank you very much first for inviting me, even if it's a risk to invite me, especially as Gerald Heinzel is much brighter than me and knows more on East Africa. And secondly, uh, I'm also not an optimist. I'm a true pessimist. I, I have to convince, and everything I will say now is not also very optimistic. So <laughs> maybe not somebody at the end of this panel has to keep himself from life after these de 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 depressing, depressing words. Um, let me let me start by you, you, the most of you know, but I will sh will very shortly touch it. The question of the of the Austrian engagement in in East Africa. To be honest, there's a colleague of mine from the Federal Chancellor here, so please don't quote me, even if it's on on on, on, on yeah, it is Chad Moses, but even if it's later on on video, uh, actually it's such a shame. Yeah, it is very limited. I mean, we have still by uh, by economic terms by the development. It is the biggest sub-region from the Austrian Development Agency mm -hmm. with two countries, Uganda and Ethiopia, which is for this sub-region very much, two countries. 
And we have still two embassies, I think, in Kenya and Ethiopia. We closed one. Where was it, George? It was in the one the last we closed, Tans Tanzania. Harare, yes. Uh, so it's Uganda and Ethiopia on the development side and two embassies. And we have nearly no military assistance uh, in East Africa, whether in the missions of the United Nations nor of the European Union, uh, and nearly no bilateral, just very small in, in Kenya and concentrating on a very small project in EGAD. And then you have, of course, other cultural and, and economical uh, ties between, between Austria and uh, East Africa. But this is, as far as this is away, uh, the less are the ties, to be honest. So the second point, uh, the Ministry of Defense has written in the year 2020, beginning in summer, we were asked by the so-called National Security Council in June to write what we call a uh, defense uh, view on risks, a risk assessment with the picture of the outlook of 2030. So we were asked and it was approved in November 2020. Um, and one of the risks within this risk picture is, uh, and, and, and I cannot say the, the, the perfect wording as it is because I haven't got it in my mind, but um, on East Africa, East Africa is in the category of risks in the uh, periphery of the European Union. And there are some regional risks and the one on, on East Africa is called uh, Global and Regional Power Games in and around East Africa. So this is how we look at it. We do not look at it, to be honest. We do not look, look on the question of what is the problem within East Africa and the East African states and communities and the people and all those things. We look at it on the question, of course, as it is true on what does East Africa mean to Europe and other sub-regions in the periphery of the European Union, and especially, as it was mentioned, um, on the trade relation between Europe and Southeast Asia. You mentioned it already, but in, in numbers, it is around 90% of the European trade between Europe and Southeast Asia that goes by ship, and of these 90%, I would say around 75 to 80% goes through the Red Sea, through Bab el Mandab and the Suez Canal, as you mentioned before. And that is a fact that we have uh, to, to see, and it's trade in both directions. It's not only to East China, uh, East uh, Asia, it is also from East Asia. And if you looked at nearly half of the income of uh, big company like Volkswagen is today produced and sold in Southeast Asia and especially China. Uh, this is a very uh, economic uh, dependency between those two regions that just go through uh, East Africa. Secondly, of course, and what we have also seen with the pandemic is East uh, Africa is also part of supply chains, especially to the regions uh, at the Gulf, being it vegetables and fruits that go day by day by planes to uh, the Gulf countries, especially the big hotels, or flowers like tulips. And everybody who knows history about the tulip war in the 17th century knows what tulips can make out of a company. Uh, and you saw while the pandemic, and this was threatening us so much, was even if people some 20 years ago would live under very bad uh, conditions in East Africa on what they produce on their soil, if they are now part of a global or regional supply chain, and if they only produce tulips and there are no tourists in the Gulf countries' hotels, so this is from one day to the other no income to this Kenyan farmer. He could live have before under very bad conditions 20 years ago with his family and maybe his village and others on what he was producing, but as he has given up uh, and had to change from the one day to the other, which is not just that simple to change from a tulip field now to back to beans or whatever, uh, we saw that the so-called integration in economic uh, supply chains global might lead to 
more stability and peace, but it mustn't. There's not a paradigm that it is true, and we see the same thing now as it happens with the war in Ukraine and Russia on the question of how does this, uh, for example, especially Sudan, East African countries rely on wheat import. I think Sudan is the country that relies the most on wheat and other grain import from the Ukraine and Russia. Yes, uh, Sudan is, uh, by percentage it's Sudan more, by numbers it's Egypt, uh, by total numbers. So then let me have a look on some of the other risks we were assuming in 2020 um, uh, on the question of East Africa. The first is of course these power games of global and regional powers within and around the Horn of Africa. Let me start at the West, even in the United States, not under Trump, already under Barack Obama, there was a shift in the Africa policy more concentrating on East Africa because of the so-called global power game with China. So leaving West Africa of some parts and concentrating more on East Africa. Then we have already mentioned the influences from the Gulf countries, but there is also an influence from East Africa to the Gulf countries. Some of the militias you mentioned from Sudan under this deputy chief of staff, Hemeti, or whatever he is now in the position, are fighting, of course, not only in Libya on the side of General Haftar, they're also fighting in the Yemen war uh, on whosoever side who pays them. So uh, we have these militias, and we have, of course, as you mentioned, militias uh, within East Africa, but we also have mercenaries, jihadist mercenaries, or so-called jihadist mercenaries from the Near and Middle East coming to Africa. We assume it's around 10,000 over the last years, so from the area of Syria, Iraq, and other countries. Uh, to be honest, a lot of them um, have been supported by Turkey to come into Africa. Libya. in Libya, but also in East Africa. A lot of them came through the, with Turkish assistance to Somalia, and some of them have now already, or even not them, but their ideas, uh, we can now see in East Congo and in Northern Mozambique. So this, let's just call it jihadist movement, even if, if I'm not happy with the term, um, has been brought to this region in areas where there have been no religious war between before, yes. not in that, not in that uh, amount. Uh, let me have a look on, on um, the military missions in and uh, with and around uh, East Africa. We have at the moment two naval, and there will be another third naval mission at the Horn, one from the uh, NATO Ocean Shield that goes from uh, the Strait of Hormuz up to the Horn, uh, then the European mission, Alpha Atalanta. Uh, both were against smuggling, trafficking, whatever, and also um, some years ago against piracy and especially in protection of the World Food Program for Somalia, Yemen, or which country ever. There will be shortly in the future a third military mission, a uh, more coalition of the willing led by the U.S., uh, especially to control ships going between Somalia and Sudan and Yemen on, in both directions on, on smuggling, trafficking, um, whatever. Then we have very long-lasting, one is closing now, the one in South Sudan, UNAMID mission from the United Nations, uh, one in uh, South Sudan, of course, and then we have the so-called hybrid mission, AMISOM, a former UN mission now in East Africa, uh, in, in uh, Somalia, which is reducing by numbers over the next years by some 2,000. So the troops are actually at the moment 19,000, uh, and within this 19,000, around 1,400 policemen. And there will be a reduction of about 2,000 military personnel over the next year. And the idea is, in the end, to hand over to the until that trained Somali security forces um, and the ending of these missions. I, I know that these missions are not um, a solution for, for the uh, root causes of these conflicts. They are, might just only be for stabilization. They are not, not, not part of a, of a solution because the solution has to come from where else. But as a military person, I will speak a bit on them. Uh, and we have this EU training mission in Somalia so this should be the one training the Somalian security forces until then AMISOM 
uh, can leave, where Austria does not take part and which was mostly driven, of course, in its origin by the Brits until the Brits were a member of the uh, European Union. And this is also a discussion within the European Union that a lot of the European Union politics versus Africa, as you mentioned it already, is of course still driven by post-colonial ties, thinking or whatever. It, it, it starts with the question of what do we do there from humanitarian assistance development up to military missions. And this is all something of how to say post-colonial aid thinking or whatever. It's not a coexistence or cooperation, as you mentioned, between the two continents on an equal basis, even if this could ever happen. I, I have my doubts that it, that it will. Uh, so this EU training mission Austria does not participate. Uh, there is an instrument from the European Union that concentrates especially on the uh, assistance of security forces um, in the regions around Europe. It's now called the European Peace Facility. It is the so-called Old African Peace Facility for those who are familiar. Um, it's a new fund that the European Union has every year with, it should normally be around 600 to 800 million per year, but this year we already exploded it because we opened it for two years for the Ukraine, which now 1.5 billion uh, euros over the next two years for the assistance of the Ukraine, mostly lethal, some non-lethal. Austria has decided only to do non-lethal assistance within the European Peace Facility for the Ukraine, but we have not decided on, on the other projects that are mostly in Africa, some are in the near and Middle East, uh, if we will support in future also so-called lethal assistance to security forces in uh, these regions. What is paid with that in Africa? Uh, this is paid is largely the so-called African Peace and Security Architecture. So this reaches from security-related topics within the African Union, within the five or six regional communities, being it uh, ECOWAS, EGAT, uh, the, the one you mentioned in Central, the Northern, which does not really exist, and the Southern, which is actually the both the, the best. Everybody is expecting SADC to be the best before. ECOWAS. We also fund by that uh, the African troops in the AMISO mission, so their salaries are paid by the European taxpayer, which is in the end um, a good thing. Uh, let me come and have a look on, on, on regional risks where we were um, very careful in 2020. There was at that time the thinking that over the next decade and so until 2030, there could be a major war between African nations uh, on the question of, for example, the water of the River Nile. So the question was, would there be a war between uh, Egypt, uh, Sudan and Ethiopia? And at that time, a lot of people thought, well, it will not happen, which was correct. And at the moment, it looks good, but to be honest, in a 10 years decade, I mean, this is not a crystal ball. We cannot look into it and say, well, it will happen or not. But in the end, we have this, still we have this risk. Uh, and we had the risk that with the contradictory between Turkey and Egypt, and both were looking for having a carrier-based strike flight fleet, strike fleet, sorry, strike fleet. So around one, Air Force carrier, one Turkish, one Egypt. This would give them both the capacity to operate in this decade from out of the Red Sea onto uh, the African, East African part of the continent. And then Egypt would have been, would have the, the capability to attack Ethiopia, not only from Egypt, but also from, from the Red Sea. And that Turkey with the same capacity could maybe side to, on, on the side of it, Ethiopia and go into war with, with Egypt, which is for the next 10 years a possibility. It is not a threat at the moment, but still there is the possibility because with potential and the idea may becomes uh, the possibility. Everybody thought the same of the Ukraine. Uh, and when we wrote this risk assessment on the Ukraine, we had the Ukraine war on possible which nobody believed at that moment. I just today have read back what I've wrote in 2020 and found out that we were sure that there is still a possibility because of the will 
and of the potential, and both together uh, makes um, the risk uh, for us. Uh, let me have a very small look on these general risks that come out of, as you mentioned, the, the mixture of drought, grasshoppers, desertification, globalization of the economy. Um, this is a general risk for all over uh, the regions around Europe, but especially also in East Africa, and we, we are very um, concerned about that. Last point, um, of course, Europe could uh, cooperate a lot with, with, with uh, East Africa and make sure that a lot of these risks that I've mentioned uh, become not a threat or, or a war. Um, and I will not talk about all these political and diplomatic measures that could be done and, and all those things. I, I'm not a specialist for this, even if I'm in, such in favor of it. Uh, and the question of economic integration, which is not um, a hindrance to a war, as we can see now. This, this paradigm of if there is economic integration, there will be no war with the Ukraine war. We see this is, this is not 100% true. Uh, but let me, uh, let me have a small look on the question of the European intervention logic. There was this intervention logic after the end of the Cold War, so starting with the Somalia, in, as you mentioned. Should we, in the end, also be willing to fight with or without the UN Security Council uh, resolution a war in favor of humanity or in favor of freedom or in favor of uh, hindering a genocide like it was in Rwanda? So there was a lot of arguments over these last 30 years. And the appetite, even if it doesn't matter if you think it's a good idea or a bad, but the appetite of the European Union and these member states of fighting such kind of wars have dramatically shrinked. One could think it's good, but one could say, if it's necessary, why not? But in the end, it is shrinking. And it was shrinking with Afghanistan. There is, I would say, this is the end of this intervention logic. And you see it by the participation of the European member states countries within the UN missions in Africa and especially in East Africa. You have nearly none European troops within that, none, which is in the end very bad for these UN missions. It is very bad. You had in Sudan, of course, the question that they didn't want. There was once the idea of having a very large Scandinavian contribution, which the Sudanese didn't want because they know when the Scandinavians are there, they will act on behalf of the mandate, which they didn't like. And to be honest, a lot of troop contributing countries are not acting on behalf of the mandate. They are acting, which I understand personally, on behalf of how do I come home safely without dying in this African country that I don't care for, uh, if I'm a Pakistani, for example. So, but they, to the end coming, there is a very limited appetite of European member states to act in the high end of, of a conflict in a military mission, even with a UN Security Council uh, resolution mandate um, in a real uh, fighting situation in Africa. There, is, there was some appetite in West Africa, but it's also declining, and there is, in the end, none in East Africa, so not to, to how to say, to think in that categories. So thank you very much. That was, again, sobering. Uh, so well, where do we stand at the end? Um, there were a few points that I would take up again uh, from Roland. I think it's good to restart thinking about commonalities of countries in the Horn of Africa and <coughs> uh, what do we do with that? I think an, an important point that you made was the militia and the militianization uh, that is not only happening in the Horn of Africa, but all over Africa. How do we deal with this? Now, if Günther says there's no appetite in dealing with <laughs> lots of that, uh, also the question, how will Africa deal with that? Um, that was at the end, you made one remark, and I think this is uh, really, this should be a guideline. I mean, we have been thinking uh, on the European side for a long time, well, uh, why are we dealing with Africa? It's solidarity. And in the end, uh, there was perhaps not enough money ready to go for solidarity. <laughs> so uh, we stressed there should be also an interest-driven uh, acting in Africa. 
Now, this has perhaps also been overdone. Uh, as you said, uh, resources were taken without proper pay, so to say. You mentioned that there should be a benevolent um, assistance from the side of the international community, from the side of Europe. And I think that is exactly uh, what we should aim for, except that uh, it's not going to be easy to have a common definition of something like this, but I think we should work at this. I'll make one point to what um, uh, Marie Roger said about the European-African relations. Well, what you said about the actual situation of Africans looking at Russia, at Europe, and they, they side with Russia, all right, I think we will have to go through that. I do think that the enthusiasm for Russia will probably end at one point. Yes. Um, but the other point is, of course, um, what do we do with the future of EU-African relations? I, I would say on this summit that you mentioned, uh, the main factor why nothing more came of it was really COVID. Uh, on both sides, there was not really proper attention to a proper preparation. And it doesn't make any sense whatsoever to have a, sum, a summit that is not carefully prepared. I mean, you, uh, uh, just to meet and talk to each other, this is not enough. So yeah. our next um, evening here in the Kreisky Forum is 8th of June on exactly this topic. The, uh, is it the 7th? I'm sorry. Um, on the 7th of June on the future of EU-AU <coughs> relations. Mm -hmm. um, I'll be there. I've talked too much already, and we have just about 10 minutes uh, for questions, remarks, uh,